All right, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, part two of implementing GIA in your environment. Uh, so I know we already saw a quick poll, so most of you, probably about 95% were in Jason's class uh, set or session earlier this morning, and that's fantastic. Uh, introduce myself, turn this over. Uh, my name is James Petty. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. I would appreciate it if you'd follow me. Uh, I'm currently at 35, so if we can make that number go up, it'd be great. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about how I implemented GIA, well, not, not just me, it was me and my team, how we implemented GIA in my environment. Now, kind of a quick, quick story. I work for the federal government, work for the Tennessee Valley Authority. We produce power for a lot of people. And we, uh, part of what we do is uh, we operate seven nuclear reactors. So nobody in this room can tell me they have more red tape than I do. And if I can implement this in my environment, I know you can. All right, we have uh, about 80 uh, slides to get through, so we're going to go kind of quick. All right, so why did we decide to implement, uh, I'm going to call it GIA, not just enough administration for the, from here on out. So why did we decide to implement GIA in our environment? Well, it was real simple. Uh, how many of you have been called in the middle of the night because a developer's scheduled task to move data from one place to another didn't run? Right, okay. Uh, the rest of you I know are probably lying. So I got tired, and the and rest of my teammates, we got tired of getting these phone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning because the scheduled tasks didn't run. Uh, and usually, the way it works with us is we have a tier, kind of a tier 2-ish help desk, and they're like, the scheduled task didn't run. Well, can you run it? No. Anybody use the power users options in 2003 and 2008? <laughs> right. All right, well, so we were using that just, just a little bit. That way we could have these tier two help desk technicians uh, run simple tasks, restarting services, restarting or starting scheduled tasks, uh, stopping and stopping processes. Well, with the introduction of UAC and server 2012 R2, that went away. It's deprecated now. You can't use it. It's there. You can put groups in it. You can put people in it. It does nothing. So, and then now, wah, 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 Gia. So I came to the summit last year. I was like, what is Gia? So I sat in one of these sessions. I was like, oh, that's cool. And now... Uh, a couple months later, we installed it. Uh, took a couple weeks, but we installed it on over a thousand machines, uh, running uh, Server 2012. Now, the first step for that was you have to upgrade to five or five zero. If you're going to upgrade to WMF five, you might as well go to five point one. It's an extra click. So that's step one. So you have to make sure you're on five point one. And then also, we we're like, oh well, why we're doing this? And with the 2016, we just built it into the 2016 image. So now I have about 300 2016 servers that are also running this. And with the amount of 2012 servers, we're up to about 1,700 servers running GIA. All right. Oh, did I hit everything there? Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, anyway, so back to the power user story. So why can't these tier two help desk technicians fix it themselves? They know what's wrong. They have the ability. They used to be able to click, and now they can't. So now I have to get called at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, uh, okay, uh, I got to log in. So it takes about 20 minutes to right-click start, and it takes me another hour to go back to sleep. That's just kind of how that works. Or even better, why can't we just empower developers to restart their own scheduled tasks? That way no one has to get called except for them. They should write better code. All right. Uh, okay, so that is the end of, end of uh, PowerPoint. I promise that was all I had. All right, so now it's demo time. Woo, okay. All right, perfect, okay. So I know Jason said a lot of his, uh, or none of his demos worked apparently is what I heard, is that correct? All right, good, so you'll be seeing this for the first time. <laughs> Does anybody have GIA implemented already? A little bit, okay. Uh, so the first way that I got started with GIA in our environment, is, uh, was I was reading all these blog articles and I was like, and I'm like, how do I make all these configuration files? These fancy modules and functions that you see up here, they weren't there. They were like, oh, here's this text file. And a couple people like Jason and a few other people had written modules to compile all this for you. But really all it was was a, uh, was a here string that they put into a text file. Uh, so there is a tool that Microsoft developed called the GIA Helper 2.0. It is an okay tool. It's a fantastic way to get started and to start figuring out how these files are generated and what goes where. It will generate half the files for you and then everything else it will, it will auto generate for you and say copy and paste and put here. It's a great place to get started in your lab environment. It's not a great place to keep going after that, but it's a really good place to start. 
Okay, so because you were all in Jason's class earlier, we are not going to go the ins and outs of what G is. We're going to kind of, we're going to go into how we're going to implement it. Uh, if you have questions about how it works under the covers, feel free to come. I'll be in uh, 403 after this, and we can talk about it there. All right, uh, so the projector messed with my font just a little bit. There, can you guys in the back still see that? Awesome. All right, I'm going to talk this way, not that way. Okay. So the first thing we have to do, so GIA is really, under, I said under, under the covers just a little bit, just a module. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to we're going to log into the server first. Okay, so a little bit about environment. I have a domain controller. I have a member server called NRDC, and then I have my Windows 7 box. All right, so now, now I'm in uh, using PS Remoting. because um, So NRDC is a 2016 core, so even if I wanted to, there's no GUI. So why remote into a machine when I can use PS, enter PS session? All right, so first thing we're going to do, we're just going to make an empty module. You have to have this structure, otherwise it's not going to work right. Nothing has to be in it, but it's still, it's still, that's what it's looking for. And we're going to click the right button. There we go. All right, now, just to show you that there was no magic. So we have the PSD, we have the manifest file. We have an empty PSM module file. That PSM1 file is not there. It will break. The manifest file doesn't have to be there, but uh, if you're going to make a module, why not make a manifest file? And uh, the most important part here is this role capabilities folder. Uh, again, if that's not there, that will not work either because that's actually where you put all of your stuff. All right, and now we're going to make our GIA configuration folder. <laughs> Now you can put this anywhere you want. The default from Microsoft is in uh, the program data uh, folder, so that's where I'm keeping it. And Microsoft always knows what's best. Uh, good, I'm glad at least one person laughed. I, I did, I guess. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the Marble Royalty checks in the mail now. All right, so this is just a folder that we're putting, uh, we'll get to it in a little bit. Oh, it's right here. So inside of this GIA configuration folder, this is where we're actually saying, so who can do what? Now, we learned in JSON session that GIA is nothing more than whitelisting. Uh, by default, you can't do anything. You can only do what I say you can do, which, right, again, so right now is nothing. Uh, I'm a, I've been a huge fan here recently of uh, splatting. So this is splatting right here. That way, uh, one little command is like this long. And uh, you don't want to use those nasty little back ticks. You don't want to do that. So splatting just kind of helps everything. Uh, you, can make it in the, you can make it in the command file. That's, that's perfectly fine. This is just how I like to do it. So then we're going to run this. We have this new PS configuration file. This is actually going to run. This, now this is the who can do what. And it goes here in the program data, the GIA configuration file. And for simplicity, everything I'm doing is called demo. So we ran that. We ran that. Yes, OK. All right, so now I have a uh, user here called Marshall who is going to do, who can now log in and do whatever is in the demo folder. Again, I haven't put anything in there right now, so he could log in and he would get, what all would he get? Right, that's correct. Say that again? Six right, the six basic, there are six basic commands that you get. Well, I'll show you what those are in just a minute. Almost. Okay. All right, so uh, we made our configuration file. We're going to, now we're going to look at it. Okay, so this is what the configuration file looks like. I said, again, so this is the who can do what. We'll get into a lot of stuff here. Uh, so it, again, it auto-generates it auto -generates all of this for you, which is really fantastic. Uh, the two things we really want to worry about here, this transcription dictionary. Um, one of the biggest problems that I had with my cybersecurity department, they were like, well, we don't want to give help desk people elevated rights on servers. And I'm like, but, but it's OK. I can track what they're doing. Uh, like I, I can provide you with a text file of everything that they've ever done. And your SIM tool can come and collect that. They're like, oh, OK. So that kind of, if, if you're concerned about uh, you're concerned about uh, some of your helpless people either not knowing kind of what they're doing or kind of maybe being malicious or whatnot. You have an exact transcript of everything that they ever did. 
So that's what this transcript directory does. By default, it puts it in the program, it puts it wherever that GIA configuration folder was, it puts it at that root. So in this case, it's the program data. You can put this wherever you want. You can put it out to your NAS, put it on a file share, you put it in OneDrive. All it needs is a UNC path, it, it does the rest. Uh, we learned what the virtual account was. Yes, question. What are the credentials you would need to have for uh, whatever. So the context that the user is running the GIA session under is what it would need to write. What it would need to write with. Oh, and also, if any of you have any questions at any time, please just kind of stop me and let me know. Uh, so we always we learned earlier we always want to run as the virtual account. Yes. No. Yep. Everybody remember why? Uh, because the account's not actually there. It gets cre it, right. That is correctly. Uh, uh, yeah. So what he said. Uh, it's <laughs> well. I was. I wasn't going to re-say it. And then I forgot that we're being recorded. So I want to make sure that it's on there. Uh, so exactly. Uh, the the account doesn't exist until you need it, and when it's not there, it's torn down. Again, can also help uh, mitigate some of the risks that your cybersecurity department may be considered about, may be worried about. There, uh, so this guy right here, I'm not using him, and I'm not using him in any of my demos. But this is basically, you can put a script on, this is on the local server now. This right here is the local server. If you want to put, you can put a hello world.ps1 in there. Or it can say, welcome to your GIA configuration, and you can put, you know, put their username in there. You can put whatever you want in there. And then this right here is the most important one. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so the hash table and a hash table. Woo. All right, so we have your domain name slash, it can be a username or it can be a global group. Uh, it doesn't care which one. You just, so um, I only have two users. I have Ted and Marshall, uh, so I don't have any more users, so I don't have a global group for that. But you would simply could replace this with, uh, you know, uh, IT help desk. If you want to do that, you're more than welcome. And then I did that, it's going to break, I promise. Undo. That'll work. That's exactly like it was before. Okay. And then this role capabilities. It's really important that you spell this correctly. I beat my head against the wall for two hours the other day because I didn't put the S on it. So this S right here, super important. <laughs> In case you were curious. All right. Uh, this role capabilities. Again, so we said we're doing a uh, demo. You can put as many role capabilities in here as you want. We'll see in a little bit how that can kind of get, get in the way. But if you have another one, uh, for instance, let's say, so separated by comma, and you wanted to say, uh, my IT help desk thing. So if you wanted to do that, you could be, you be perfect well, and then this user or this group would have access to both of these, uh, about both of these roles. So we're gonna get rid of this and we'll put it back like it was. We're not gonna save. All right, so we, already made, so we already made this, so now we're gonna close it. Nope, there we go. Now, at any time, if you ever wanna edit that configuration again, you can do one of two things. You can recreate it with this new, like we did. You can do this new PS session configuration, rename it as, a, as the same file, and it'll overwrite itself, or you can open that file just like I had it there, and you can manually type out the changes. It's 100% up to you. If you're making a lot of changes, I would script it. If all you want to do is say, okay, I want to change demo to demo two, I would, I would change it in a text editor. It's just my preference is 100% up to you. All right, now we know that who can do something, what can they do? So we have another new fancy file, or command, new PS role capability file. Uh, so I'm just, this is the default out of the box. I did not do anything with it. We're going to run it. We're going to always double check to make sure that we're in here. So we're going to run this. Uh, so by default, again, so everything goes in this role capabilities file in the module. So I chose to put it in program files, Windows PowerShell modules. That's where Microsoft default goes. And obviously what's good for Microsoft is good for the rest of us. Why do you keep laughing? Okay. All right, so now we're going to look at this file here, just real quick. 
This is where you put all of your fancy stuff that what you, can, what you want your users to be able to do when they log in. So as you can see, everything is, everything is commented out. They still can't do most things. Now I'm gonna show you right now actually what a user can do out of the box. So we've already made that. Okay, I'm gonna jump around, going a little bit off script, so we'll see if it works. All right, so the next thing we have to do is now we have the who, we know who can do something and we know what they can do, but we still haven't told the machine to allow them to come in. All right, so here we go. Uh, I'm really bad at typing, so I'm gonna put my password in once. Just save that in a credential file or, or variable. Uh, so we're going to do, we're going to enter the PS session. Uh, again, core, uh, core box with just a black screen, why RDP? Uh, enter PS session, computer name, this is the part right here that is super important. If I try to log in, um, this button, there we go. Uh, so you got to tell the configuration name. Anybody know what the configuration name is by default? If you don't put something in, what does it put in for you? Right, okay, well, let's just look real quick. All right, let's get on the right server. All right, so these are the default configurations that you have. So. Yeah, you're correct. So Microsoft at Power, Microsoft at PowerShell is the default. Uh, anytime you do an inner PS, a little off topic. Anytime you do an, an inner PS session, you come into this Microsoft at PowerShell. But it's good. It's good to know to get the difference between the two. So now, uh, so I, ha I have my username here. I'm trying to get into the demo. I have. I'm trying to do it as Marshall. I'm going to run it, and oh, doesn't work because. Marshall does, and his virtual account, does not have access to the, uh, to the Microsoft at PowerShell, so we can't do it that way. And as we saw over here, this demo configuration is not anywhere in here. All right, so we're gonna run this next command here. We're gonna register the PS session configuration. Uh, so you have to tell it where the PSSC file is. This, is. this is the file that says what you can do, since it's gonna be in your program, to, it's gonna be in your program, um, I'm sorry, this is the who, I'm sorry. This is the who, the PSSC file knows what the what is. Not, no, run the whole thing. Excellent. Now, you're gonna see some more, you're gonna see some red text back here. When you run this register PS session configuration, it restarts the WinRM service. So if you're doing this remotely, you will notice you got kicked, you got kicked out of your machine. That's all this right here it means. So now we have to get back into the machine. Oh, look. Okay, so now what's gonna happen, so I'm logged in as Ted. Ted is a domain admin. If I try to log in with a demo configuration, what is going to happen? I'm sorry, what was that? That's correct, it will not work. Right, because I have not been explicitly told that I can do something. We get this nice little error message. It says access is denied, and if you're thinking to yourself, I am a domain admin, why can't I get in? It's because you haven't allowed yourself in. Who doesn't talk to themselves at work? <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna come back over here. Uh, okay, so notice so I went into a different PowerShell tab, so I'm not logged in here to Nano, or to NRDC. Uh, so now we're gonna log in. Woo! So now, now ironically enough, if you wanna know who you are, the command who am I dot exe is not whitelisted. Shocker. All right, so we were talking about what you can and what you can't do out of the box. Here is what you can do. There we go. These are the eight commands. So even if you don't explicitly say, if you just had that blank file, which is what we created before, these are the eight commands that you can run. I get, luckily get command as one of them. So there's not really much you can do with these. I mean, I can see what I can do, but I can't do anything with it, right? A 
Good question. Yes. You proxy by you mean proxy by alias or? Mm -hmm. Oh no! So this is the uh, these are the uh, the full commands. Uh, so I think we learned in Jason's class earlier you can restrict the parameters that they can use, but unless you do that, they get all of them. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Question, yes. Yes, because you don't have a way to get to them. Now, I, I do want to make sure very clear. We, everything that I'm running now, I am running on the local machine. I'm not, I'm not, doing, I'm not using uh, any kind of special, special remoting or third party or whatnot. Okay. So now we're going to come through. So okay, so now we're like, okay, I can get in now. Now I need to do something. So the first thing that we started off with uh, was some very basic commands. And that would be get process, get service, and being able to, re being able to restart servers. Nine times out of 10, if you call me in the middle of the night and you say something's broken, my first question is, did you restart it? Uh, now, if you ask me at one o'clock in the afternoon, my, question, my answer is gonna be different, but you just woke me up from um, just woke me up in the middle of the night. So did you restart it? Did that fix it? Okay, thanks. All right. So, uh, so again, I told you this role capability file, you can edit it however you want. Uh, for simplicity, I am just making a new one. We're going we're gonna to re-enter our PS session. Okay, so now we have our new capability file. Will, now that I'm back over here at Marshall, how many of you, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you think I will be able to see the command get process? One, okay, fantastic. All right, because you, you are correct. I will not be able to see anything. If I run a git command again, Oh no! Okay. While that's restarting, all right. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk here for a little bit. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so the reason that, that that that's not going to work. Thank you, recovery mode. So the reason that that's not going to work is because anytime you put a new capability file down, you have to restart the you, you don't have to restart WinRM service, but anybody who is currently logged in only gets the sessions from when they first logged in. So if you made changes to it, they have to log out, log back in, and get that new whitelist. This is still trying to restart. This is why you should use VS Code. Question, yes? Uh, because they don't, they don't have the rights on the server to be able to edit the, to edit the they don't have the rights to that uh, folder. So they can't edit the configuration itself. Now, I do highly suggest that you lock down, you know, don't, obviously don't let the world be able to edit this folder. But uh, so me as a Windows Server Administrator and a domain admin, uh, I'm the only one that can edit these files. So I am giving you the ability to do something. All right. Okay, where were we? All right, so I'm gonna log over here with, uh, since I got kicked out of my session. Yes, I know I didn't put anything in there. Okay, so now if I run the git command, I can now see the fact that I have git, git process, git service, and restart computer. All right, so now my help desk can do the simplistic stuff. Once they get the gist of this, okay, now they're like, oh, I can fix problems. And then they started calling me, and they're like, they're like my IS web server broke. Uh, and I know that all I have to do is restart the app pool, because that's what you told me to do, but I can't do it. Uh, so they're, they were actually starting to want more and more rights to be able to do things. We're like, well, okay. You don't want to call me in the middle of the night? Good with me. All right, did I... Did you have a hand up or are you just wrestling? Well, going back to restart computer, you restart computer, you 
You can't. Yeah, you can, but they don't have the rights. To, they don't have the rights on the server to be able to invoke that command. They have again. So they have zero. They have they have zero rights on the server. Right. So so they would have to. The, you could you could. This does also work with invoke command. The invoke command has this configuration name. So, but unless they put this configuration name in there, then they don't have the rights. Because by default, they would hit the Microsoft.PowerShell, okay. which we saw that only, only the local administrators on the box had access to. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, let's see where we can go. Okay. All right, so now we're, so then we're like, okay, so you want more stuff. We're like, okay, here you go. How about, re, how about restarting uh, schedule tasks? How about, um, and then, so then they started doing, they wanted to start scripting on their own. Uh, they wanted to start making their own scripts to start checking their own services and their own whatnot. So then they start typing in there and they're like, well, I can't, you know, I don't have access to where object. And I'm like, well, why do you want where object? I'm like, well, I'm just trying to script. I want to get, you know, where all the processes are stopped. I'm like, okay. So you, again, whitelisting, I had to get explicitly give them access to the where object. Then the select object, I'm like, whoa, okay, let me just look at this for a minute. It's like, cause, so you can, you can sit out here and you can list out all these commands and your file can get really long. Or you can do uh, wild, card, wild cards. I have one in here somewhere, no I don't. Okay, well, all right. Bottom, okay, yeah, so that's web administration, but we can still use it. So let's say that you want to give someone access to all of the git commands. You get to the point, you're like, I don't care. You can get all the data that you want. You still don't, you still don't have the rights to start and stop. So you can do, um, get, you kind of have to, this is, this, it gets a little wonky here, but you can do all of the visible commandlets. So we have to make sure we know the difference between commandlets and functions, and we can use the git command to be able to the, differentiate between those. But I can do git star. You can have all the git commands, commandlets, in here. Let me just show you that real quick here. All right, so if you want to do the where object, for instance, because this, this is where it kind of started, these, these default Microsoft ones is where we were starting to get hung up on. They started wanting all of that, so I said fine. Microsoft.PowerShell.Core, Microsoft.PowerShell.Management, and Microsoft.PowerShell.Utility. You know, get, get star. You can have all of that, um, and you know, because that gives them a whole bunch of stuff. So then they got. So then they were like, okay, now I can do schedule. I can. Oh, let me just. I think I'm a jumping ahead of myself. Right. We didn't actually make this file, did we? All right, well, let's, let's make it real quick. Okay, like I said, and there we go, and just like that. So let me exit. Let me go back in. Oh, no. Oh, perfect timing. So I did select the wrong one. That was a completely on accident, but it's a perfect segue into what, what I was going into next anyways. So I, this is the configuration file that I made right here. It's highlighted. Let me make this full screen again. So, is, so can anyone take a wild guess as to why this bomb? Yes, you can't see the error message because that gives you the answer. Does anyone have any guesses real quick? What, you, what was that? That is correct. Uh, right, good job. Uh, so even though you're whitelisting uh, what, is what a person can do, uh, you can only give them access to commandlets and functions that are on the server itself. So now my uh, help desk people, they're like, I want to be able to restart uh, IS web websites and IS web pools. We're like, fantastic. Uh, so then we started looking, we're like, okay. So I just had this one G configuration. I have it on all 1,700 servers. And then I put web administration slash git. And it stopped working. Because the IS server is... The IS server is not on all 1,700 servers. It's only on 200 of them. So then we had to backtrack just, just a little bit. So then we had to make a different role. Now, I did not do that here, but what I will show you, because this is going to take just, just a minute, so we'll talk about it while it's installing. 
Sorry, so I'm here on my remote server. Now I'm go I am going to install the IIS web feature. Uh, I did this earlier, it takes about 45 seconds, so as long as ISC doesn't crash again, we'll be fine. Anyway, so what we were finding out was uh, the, more, the, more, the more power and the more, more responsibility we were giving them, the more that they were ingesting, the more, they, the more they wanted to do, which was fantastic. So we started giving them these said more and more and more commands, access to more fun access to more functions. So anyway, so back to the IS while that's installing. So up here, doo -doo -doo, this guy right here. In this role definitions right file right here, I can easily I can put another another you know I can do this. So now I have an IIS and a demo. So you have to make sure that that IIS configuration is, is over there. But the way that we actually chose to do it was to actually make a completely separate um, configuration file. That's just a decision that we made. It's not saying it's the right way. It's not saying that's the way you should do it. That's the way that we decided to do it. And the way that we decided to do that is because of the way we have, have IIS deployed through our GPOs, it was easy to add just a little one-liner script, a one, a one line to our a GPO script that said copy this file over and register to configuration. Anyways, okay. So now that we have IS installed, uh, so these are all the commands that come with the uh, web server, web server role. So again here, notice here, they're all commandlets. I can now enter the session. Oh, I can't. Why not? Uh, no, I think my problem was I was jumping around on here and it restarted, and I don't know where I'm at. Okay, let's run this again. Okay, let's run this again and see what happens. So remember when I was typing earlier and I was messing with it and I said it's going to break? This guy right here? Are we sure? Okay, we'll do no dash. We'll see. We'll see if that happens. We'll see if that works. Oh yeah, look at the, yep. Thank you for that. All right, one more time. Making our new file. And now do this. And run. Excellent job. There is no dash in web administration. Yes. Okay. All right. So now we run to get command. And I can now see that I can, you know, all. So again, I did just the get. So I have every git command that was, in, that was inside of there. And then from here, we're like, okay, here, go play. I put it on some dev servers. Like, go, go play with these commands. Now tell me what you want after this. So they're like, well, that's when they came back with, Okay, start you know the web server the the app pool the web you know the web the websites. Uh, some of them actually want to start doing code you know do uh, do code promotes via there via that way be able to update the website. And, uh, and it was fantastic. We actually have just recently started started doing this with our SQL servers. Uh, so you can it's the exact same thing just just uh, make sure the SQL server uh, role is installed. Uh, and we're also uh, rolling this out to developers. We are. Some of our developers who kind of know what they're doing uh, on Windows stuff and PowerShell, we're actually giving them their own configurations so they can start and stop their own services and, and in some instances actually create their own services because they like to make services to run their websites. So these are all uh, things that you, uh, that you can do uh, using Gia. Okay, I believe that is all of my demos. I got about... Six minutes left. Anybody have any questions? Oh, lots of hands. Oh, lots of hands. Okay, we'll start. I saw you first. 
you mentioned that you can save the logs or the, all the uh, yes on, on a on a share. Yep. The user would need access to that share. Yes. Can the user go and delete or update the file and just replace all the commands that they've done previously with just rubbish? Right. So if you're going to put it on a some on somewhere else that's not on the local machine, right. Right, you want to you want to make sure that they're all, that they only have write that they don't have um, yes they want to they want to be they need create because what it does here I'll show you this real quick. Uh, no, so when you exit the session, it just dumps the history out. Uh, here, and then program data hidden. So this is the geotransaction log. So this was, so uh, when you push exit, it just dumps the entire history out. Uh, uh, so personally, what we're doing is we're actually leaving it there. Okay, so, okay. Uh, so we're actually leaving everything local, and our security department sim, sim tool is coming around and grabbing it. I think you had a question? Yeah. Or someone over here. So we do, uh, we do constraint endpoints. We do run as endpoints. Where, where does this fit in? Like, do you have any opinions on how we transition to this? And your crib notes on what the, what the uh, I mean, the logging obviously is an advantage, but what else? Come and see me afterwards. That's a longer conversation. Yes? Uh, when these virtual accounts are getting spun up and thrown down, does they just look like a local admin account is being created, or is there some kind of, like, how does that look in the edge of the event viewer? Oh, in the event viewer. Uh, that is a great question that I do not know the answer to because I have never looked. Uh, this is what it looks like in the log file, though. But uh, when we're done, if you want to come up here, we'll take a look at the event, at the event logs real quick. Uh, yes? Can you play non-PowerShell non commands? Net stack. Absolutely. Um, where is it? Inside this configuration file, you can give access to... Actually, where is that? PS edit. This guy right here. Oh, another thing that another thing that I didn't touch on, just that I want to touch on real quick. Uh, if for some reason you have lazy help desk people and they want to start using aliases and they want to do question mark instead of where object, you have to implicitly give them aliases because by default they don't have access to any aliases. And then external commands right here. This, this guy right here. Yeah, uh, just where you and you had to put the full path. You had to do C colon Windows System 32. And this is where you can put, if I wanted to do the who am I, who am I command, I would have put it right there. Yes, Max? So you can do namespace module. I, I know it's not we have the, the module to import. But can you namespace on modules, and then you can restrict only the gaps on this module, and things like that? Yes, I do believe that is correct. Uh, and if for some reason you had a function or a module that you had wrote yourself, and you want that imported, uh, you can import that as part of the session. Uh, yes. Um, if worry about the profile script on the target machine. Uh, you as so what you can do. Um, profile. So are you saying you have a profile script attached to every user on the machine? Yeah. If for some reason there was an all users right host script sitting there, would that be executed for the user? Yes. So you will have to make sure that you take that into account the request. Correct. Yes. How does that work in terms of dependencies? Like if one module relies on another module, <laughs> then it needs both. So, yeah. So the question was, if one module relied, if module A relied on module B, uh, then they both modules they would they would have to be able to get there to do that. Uh, that's all your hand parts. Yeah. Uh, so let's say that one of those get commands uh -huh. turned a dot net object with say a delete method. Would the user then be able to take that object and call the delete method? That is a fantastic question that I will have to look up for you. <laughs> okay. All right. Talk to him. All right. Just I got uh, just a few more minutes. Yes. Yeah. The, the uh, SMB access for the blogging and the big files. Yep. So when the virtual account is created, it is created uh, as part of the local administrator group. So that's how it can read and write to that C drive. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, I am not. Uh, I have heard of other companies. I think Microsoft is actually doing that uh, as well. So you could actually, you could very well use it to restrict yourself uh, if that's how you want to do it. That's just not something that we have implemented at my company. Can he, the council are not need any special rights? Security rights? What do you mean? The rights assignments? Uh, allowed to log on versus security by something? Uh, no, you just need to, uh, so I, I did the, uh, the virtual server only, so that, so I only, so I did not uh, allow them to be able to RDP, so they can only use this via an inner, inner PS session or via an invoke command. So other than that, and you put it in that configuration file, uh, that we've we heard that PSSE file that we first created, you put it in there, and that's, if it's not in there, then they, then they can't log on, because they have no other rights on the server. Right. So if they were just, right. So basically, the, it's, what it's saying is saying that the local accounts, so in this case Marshall, was allowed to create that virtual account. And that virtual account is then what then ran, ran everything. Self-help. Right, exactly. Yes, self-help. Yes? Every server that Outlast needs access has have those files. That is correct. Uh, that's what I did forget to mention. Uh, the way that we decided to deploy this is we did a, G, uh, a logon script uh, for, for our servers as a GPO. So I have all of my servers and maintenance windows, so every one of my servers reboots once a month. So I knew that they were all going to get this. You can also run the invoke command um, just and, and put the script block in there and just tell it to tell it to copy all these things. That's how we did it the first time, is I just ran it from my machine and hit all of them. And then from there, we just kept uh, putting that log on script. So yeah, so that server, that PSSC file that we created, which is the who, the who file, the PSR, the other file, which is the what they can do, has to, be on, has to be on every file, and then you have to register that configuration on every server. Last call for questions up here. If not, I'll be over. Yes? There's been a few discussions on WAN as well, as in doing it for a schedule. I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, there's been, in some of the other sessions, there's been some discussions on scheduling when uh, those specific rights are allowed. Where's that done? <laughs> Just okay, just in time. Yeah. So, uh, and and don't let, especially project managers are really bad at this. Don't get just, just in time is a, it's different than just enough. Um, so that you say, I think you're kind of maybe maybe blurring the two a little bit, but uh, you could, I guess you could create a schedule test to register and unregister, if you wanted to. Ah, uh, okay. That is my stopping point. Uh, I. If, if you have any other questions, I'll be up here for just a few minutes. If not, uh, I'll be more than happy to hang out in 403. See everyone at Tavern Hall tonight.